No. <laughs> Um, I've lately put a moratorium on them coming in. Yeah, I've been saying no to books lately. The reason you can't hear me is because I turn off my mic when I play the interview on the Weekly Space Hangout and then uh, I forget to turn my mic back on. So that's that's why. So we're talking about books and how we get books sent to us. And uh, Pamela has has said, that's it. No more books. I For now I can't help myself. I love books. <laughs> and and clearly I'm on some kind of list. So what do I got recently, I got on the future prospects uh, for humanity from Martin Rees, who's, of course, uh, one of my favorite, uh, you know, he's the from the Royal Astronomical Society, has his perfect balance of astronomy enthusiasm and gloom and doom for the for the uh, existential threats that face all humanity. I love it. Uh, an advanced copy of Interplanetary Robots, True Stories of Space Exploration by Rod Pyle. And I love Rod Pyle's stuff. He digs deep and finds like really interesting stories from the history of space flight. And I really enjoy his work. And so I am not going to lie. I get a little inspired when, when Rod's books come my way. Uh, the rise of science by Peter Shaver. It's all about science from prehistory to the far future. And the piece, the resistance, uh, the national geographic 2019 almanac, which is super cool. And a thing that I've always wanted to do, but have never done. Like I thought it would be kind of neat to do a, an almanac of space every year where you're like, here's all the cool stories. Here's all the cool pictures. Yeah. You know, wrap it up at the end of the year. And then people just have something that's hardcover that just reminds them of all the really neat discoveries that happen with great pictures and things like that. So that. And they also gave me the second edition of their Space Atlas. Forward by Buzz Excellent. Aldrin. Yeah, I so this is the second version of it, and it is just, I mean, it's just gorgeous, and it is the kind of book that I would have absolutely loved, you know, back when I was a when I was a kid. Do you remember of uh, the Time Life Our Universe book? I yep. yeah, that was. I'm sure I have that somewhere still. Yeah, I I I need to buy a copy because I at some point along my journey got rid of it, and yet it is one of the most meaningful ones. But the but the crazy part is, um, uh, when I uh, when I was a kid and I got that book, there was one picture that freaked me out, and it's it was it was, it was a picture of like an apple core, like all dried up, I and mean, they were just making some explanation about like how the Earth, what the crust shrunk and Mercury and crumpled together a little bit. I forget what it was, but for some reason it freaked me out as a little kid. And so my mom had to tape over a piece of paper. An so that, apple core. An apple core, like a dried out apple. Uh, yeah. So, so I had that relationship with a picture of a tarantula that was a little too zoomed in. Yeah. But like I've encountered apple cores. Yeah. And, and so, and I like to eat apples. No, no, I have no idea why. I was like three years old or something, right? Children, so, there's no logic to yeah, children. Yeah. No, I don't know why that's how, but I remember that. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And I want the one, but I had the original one. And now I want the one that has the, um, the additional information on uh, Neptune and, and Uranus from the Voyagers. So that's the, awesome. whatever edition that was. And of course, time so anyway i'll uh, i'm gonna i'll buy one i'm sure i can get one on on the ebay for cheap cheap or amazon uh, i'm gonna say hi to a bunch of people hi to aaron c ben caleb Bork clankar dusty reichwin elite geeks giselle sabrin graham w Guido bibra hal f hill Bjorkog, israel palanayuki uh, jason elric jim becker john yogurst John Suffield, Mark Sheeran, Mr. Tom Harbin, Nancy Graziano, Paranor, Richard Hayes, Ricky Buxton, Roman Geber, uh, Susie, Susie Murph, Will Peppers, and Zapfan Zapfan. Hey, everybody. Just remember, when you 
join the chat over on the YouTube. Just say hi, and then I'll get a chance to say your, your name. Uh, ben Kill is talking about the Time Life Oceans book with the shark page. I had that one too. All right, so here's a conversation. We'll get into the show in a second. Just be patient. But what is your alternate job in an alternate universe? Alternate universe Pamela, if she wasn't an astronomer, what were her alternate job be and i'll tell you what mine was is i raised money for to search for gold in the oceans because i because the time life book had like shipwrecks and it had great sort of uh photographs of people finding these old shipwrecks and so i would i would be like you know raising money i'd have a ship we would travel around the world i'd be searching for pirate treasure in my alternate universe career that's what i'd be doing you? So, so I just read a short story by Isaac Asimov about a rich scientist who has a yacht and builds filtration systems into the um, wheel, the, the one, the propulsion system, so that they can filter out materials as they go around the ocean. And there's so little gold in ocean yes. water that that wasn't use it, worth it, but uranium, apparently is where it's at with ocean water. I remember that the, Isaac Asimov did a book. And so was, I don't know if that was in the fiction of it, yeah. but he did. So he did a nonfiction book and he covered that concept. And he did the math for how much gold there was gold, gold from sea uranium, water other and materials. uranium and other materials. And that anyone, if they could figure it out, they could actually raise money that way. So anyway, I, I, I love it. Uh, Isaac Asimov is so great. <laughs> Like the hardest but, but working so man is this the alternate alternate thing you'd be based on as a kid or based on what you know now as an adult now as an adult like like alternate universe like i just imagine there's a you know there's a version of me uh, obviously i'm the one with the goatee so i'm the evil fraser but there's a there's a you know an alternate universe a mirror universe and there's another fraser picked another career destination and instead of nerding out about the R universe one he nerded out about the uh the sharks and the buried treasure one and then that's the that was the the path that i would go down so i would have gone in an animal science and if i could get it there was a job ad i saw a couple of years ago for someone whose job is designing puzzles for octopi <laughs> at a california aquarium and I want that job. It, it, it involves machine tools. It yeah. involves putting shrimp at the ends of puzzles and keeping octopi oc oc occupied. Occupied, octopi, occupied octopuses. I love <laughs> and, it. And I would totally, I would totally have gone into animal right. science. In the chat, tell me what your uh, alternate jobs would be. Uh, clearly, I've thought a lot about this. And so have you, which I think is uh, just uh, is awesome. All right, um, let's get on with this show. If you have no idea what it is that you've stumbled into, we're going to record a live episode of Astronomy Cast. Then we're going to stick around and we're going to answer your questions about space and astronomy. Let's do it. I'm ready to record okay. whenever you're ready to record. I've got my intro. I I am pressing. Whoa! Ah, Don't shit. do that. <laughs> Instead of recording, you played back a... Some kind Something of audio of a wrong. buzz saw. I don't know what occurred. <laughs> Let's try that again. Um, my ears actually hurt as a result of that. That was really loud. Okay. Testing, testing, testing. Yeah, I, I hear you. Okay. You can hear so... me. Your your hearing was only slightly damaged. My ear actually hurts from that. That sounded loud. What could it... possibly have done that? I I appear to have had some sort of an evil feedback loop with my headset and it has been resolved by sending one set of audio off into nowhere. Yep. Okay, are you ready to press record? I'm never more ready. Okay, hi, Chad. Hello, Chad. Here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 505, Seismology. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based 
Journey Through the Cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I, I'm doing well, as, as an astute listener will have... <laughs> Uh, been yeah. able to notice uh, we're moving institutions. Um, there's a whole lot of different reasons for this, but bottom line, I'm going to be at an organization with roughly a hundred other PhD scientists all working on cutting edge research. And I'm getting back to my astronomical roots uh, or at least planetary roots in this case. And Astronomy Cast is going on this journey. We have a new 501c3. If you are aiming to make year end donations, now is the time to do it um, because we want to be able to pay our staff. And please, while we're sorting the finances of the transfer, <laughs> yeah. everything will transfer. Everything will transfer. Um, but now, now your, your donations would really be useful for making sure that Susie gets paid, Chad mm -hmm. gets paid server gets paid. Amazon yep. kind of likes to get paid. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, congratulations. Um, Thank you. And uh, I, I look forward to working with the Planetary Science Institute, especially so much of the work that we do through CosmoQuest is directly connected to a lot of really interesting planetary science research. I know you always go to the conferences every year, so uh, it's a great fit. And actually, I highly recommend there. I get a ton of news from the Planetary Science Institute's news feed. It's one of the best that's out there, so uh, highly recommend it. Um, I need to remind everybody that Dr. Paul Sutter and I are going to be going to Costa Rica with a few dozen of our best friends. And uh, we've reached the minimum for so for the number of people to come. So we're definitely doing the trip. And I think we've got about another six weeks, right to the end of December, for people who want to sign up to be able to commit to the trip. So if you're interested in joining us in Costa Rica, which we're going to take telescopes, we're going to see volcanoes, we're going to see wildlife, and then every night we're going to be doing sky or, uh, sky watching. I'm going to teach you the night sky uh, with these beautiful dark skies in Costa Rica. So if this is a thing that you want to be a part of, uh, you should definitely go to astrotours.co and uh, and check it out. Uh, and oh, oh, yeah. if, if the timing and price or both is wrong for that trip, yep. I'm taking people on a tour of the American Southwest next end of summer, fall, depending on your point of view. And that's astrotours.co slash starstrider. And uh, come see my favorite part of the world. Awesome. Uh, and, and, and we've been we've been informed that it's not just about space. This is the key is that it's going to be like it's mostly about tourism and adventure and experiencing these places. And so it's a great thing to bring your significant others. Don't worry, it's not going to be overly spacey. But uh, so you know, just in case you've got someone who's on like on the fence, I'm like, I don't know, it's gonna be a lot of nerds there. Really, like, yes, there will I, be a I lot of nerds there. But beautiful scenery, yeah, beautiful rocks. You'll have beautiful birds. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. All right. So we're always interested in the surface features of the planets and the moons and the solar system, but that's only skin deep. Turns out these worlds have an interesting inner life too, thanks to the science of seismology. We can peer into our planet and learn how it works inside and we're about to take that technology to mars pamela seismology what is it and how does it work it's the science of everything how shake everything blah starting over oh, that was had something good. clever to say i know i heard it i can hear it happening i said it is the study of things that shake rattle and roll um so i mean we're all mostly familiar with this idea of seismology as a way to detect earthquakes Exactly. So uh, our world, like many worlds, for a variety of different reasons, will have waves passing through it. And it's the study of how these waves move through a world that is seismology. And we're used to thinking of it in terms of earthquakes, which on our planet, Earth in the quake, I, these are usually triggered through plate, plate tectonics 
tectonic shifts. This is where the crustal plates are moving under each other, over each other, and beside each other. And as they move, they don't do it in a smooth and continuous motion. Rather, they periodically release a whole bunch of energy and jump anywhere from millimeters to meters in distance. And as they make these jumps, as they release this energy, well, you end up with both compression waves, like sound waves that we sense when, when our eardrum gets rattled. We get sound waves moving through the soils, the rock, the liquid in the crust of the earth. And we also get the more up and down sinusoidal waves that we're more used to thinking about when we think of how a guitar string vibrates. So let's go into that. I know that uh, scientists call them S waves and P waves, right? Yes. So, so can you give sort of like what, if you were experiencing a, an S wave, like you're standing there, you're experiencing an S wave, what would that feel like in terms of like an earthquake? Well, uh, some of the worst earthquakes out there, you actually catch videos where you can see the land Ooh. doing the up and down Yay, thing. Yeah, I've seen that. Um, <laughs> in general, in general, uh, it's not going to be that dramatic. And what seismometers uh, detect is much um smaller we'll just go with smaller yeah. uh, so here what you're looking at is individual particles as they get vibrated will get oscillated spatially and that oscillation spatially that is perpendicular to the motion of the wave so the particle moves perpendicular to the motion of the wave that is the s wave which actually stands for secondary waves because these waves these up and down vertical waves they move slower through the crust and they only move through the rocky bits of the planet earth when they hit the liquid under the mantle they're like nope i'm done i'm not going to oscillate that liquid and and so they only travel through the outer rocky levels of our planet and they travel slower and get well get to the recipient of the wave second and the p S. and the p wave that's the primary wave i'm guessing exactly so the P wave is the primary wave. This is the compression wave. And in this case, particles that are getting moved move in the exact same direction that the wave is oscillating. So you'll have particles that get compressed and, and they move in the exact same kind of wave that you get with stop and go traffic. Stop and go traffic is actually a form of compression wave. So the motion of your car, one hopes, is in the direction of motion of the wave. Right. Um, and I mean, those who have experienced earthquakes and we get them all the time here on Vancouver Island, everyone is always like, are you OK? Everyone, whenever there's an earthquake, I get these emails. from you. I'm sure you get that for tornadoes and stuff. Right. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, people will, will mention me on Twitter whenever there's an earthquake on Vancouver Island and they happen all the time. And people are like, are you all right? Yeah, I'm all right. Um, uh, <laughs> but we feel them, though, for sure. <laughs> And, uh, and it is this really unsettling feeling that the world, like, like the, the world is moving back and forth. And it's this, it's the uh, hard to explain, like, it's just this feeling There's like someone's, someone's grabbed really you and is just sort it. of pulling you back and forth. It's, it's really unsettling. So, so we get earthquakes here. I, uh, we're, we're near the San Madres fault and we have a constant background of magnitude threes and periodically they creep much higher. And the first time we had one of these larger ones after I moved here, I woke up in the middle of the night and went to kick the dog off the bed because it felt like there was a dog doing the scratch, 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 scratch thing yeah. on the bed, shaking the bed. And there was no dog. Right. So <laughs> earthquake, dog scratching on bed, similar yeah. for the correct magnitude I, of I think rate. that's exactly right that that when you go through one of these it is a lot faster than you think it's going to be like you expect it would be like it is it is like um shake 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 that's what it sounds like you know in your that's how it feels is that you know that speed is what it is how it's sort of shaking back anyway um we're going a little too far down the what earthquake uh, rabbit holes feel like um but uh but uh, so then seismology the science what is what is 
seismology doing? What is it looking for? And, and how are, you know, how are scientists using this? So, so seismology doesn't just measure the earthquakes. It literally measures all the things that shake, rattle, and roll. So a good seismometer is going to notice that semi-truck that goes rattling down your street. It's going to notice the uh, explosion of the local frackers. It's going to uh, notice a landslide happening on a nearby mountain. Now, these are all surface events. And it also, we've used seismometers to notice when North Korea, which is the most recent nation to have done underground nuclear testing, we could measure where it occurred using seismometers. And the cool thing is that since these are waves traveling through rocks, they're moving at a finite speed. And while different waves going through different parts of our planet will end up going slightly different velocities. Some parts of the planet are a little differently textured than others. But by having seismometers scattered all over the world, having experienced decades of earthquakes, explosions, and other such things that go boom and bang, we can now reverse engineer exactly where a wave started to figure out, okay, so we had an undersea earthquake one kilometer below the ocean floor off the coast of Indonesia. We needed tsunami alert versus we had a earthquake 10 miles underneath the Andes mountains. Everyone be calm. Right. But the, but I guess, I mean, there is the using uh, seismometers to detect earthquakes and the strength of earthquakes and that kind of stuff is is very important. It tells you what's going on right now. But one of the parts that I find so fascinating is that is that these waves as they move through the planet have allowed scientists to really understand what's inside the planet to map it exactly. out by listening to it. And, and this all comes down to the fact that we have the primary waves, the compression waves, will travel through anything. They're happy to compress liquid, they're happy to compress rock. Just like sound waves, you can still hear, although badly, a radio if you're under the pool. Sound waves move through liquids. Sound waves move through solids. And these P waves generated within our planet or on the surface of our planet move through all parts of the planet. Now, the S waves, the ones that, that oscillate things, uh, since they give up the ghost when they hit liquids, they have to travel around. And by measuring travel times of these two different kinds of waves, you can get at the different kinds of routes they had to take to get from where the earthquake, the landslide, the nuclear reaction occurred to wherever the seismometer is. And by scattering these things all over the place, we can do things as, as wild as mapping out the distribution of lava underneath a Hawaiian island. Right, right. And, and so you'll get this really powerful earthquake that'll happen in Indonesia or in... Uh, Iran or in Haiti. And these are, on the one hand, they are absolutely sort of human catastrophes where yeah. there's significant loss of life. But every every one of these events, they're so powerful that they generate these waves that roll through the planet and bounce off of the different layers in the planet in different ways. And so every time there's one of these events, scientists are able to make these really large connections to see how these things are moving around and understand more about just like, what are the layers? I mean, that's literally how they figured out the core of the earth, the outer core of the earth. They figured out how many cores the earth has, the, the mantle, the crust, how thick these things go just by how these waves are moving through and bouncing and reflecting and refracting and all of this through the planet. And, and it's not just the earth that seismology works for. And, and this is where the, the Apollo astronauts tried their own hand at mapping out the guts of the moon 
using seismometers that were placed on the lunar surface. Moonquakes. Exactly. So uh, back with Apollo 11, this is Buzz Aldrin here that we're talking about. They actually took uh, some seismometers, well, a seismometer, and placed it on the moon's surface to detect moonquakes. Now, the moon isn't geologically active the way the Earth is. Uh, but it does get hit by rocks from space. It does have the periodic landslide and these different things that it experiences create seismic waves. And uh, they were able to detect 100 to 200 hits of meteorites during the life of the seismometer that they had on the moon. Um, and that's that's kind of amazing if you think about it and so the problem at this point is with a lot of the other worlds like we've only had a working seismometer on earth on and on the moon but it's a big solar system and we really want to understand the interior the inner lives of of all of the worlds in the solar system and we're going to get our next one in just like three weeks now when yeah. nasa's um mars insight lander arrives at mars what are we going to learn and what and sort of what what have they got planned for this so if all goes well on november 26th the mars insight lander is going to get to the red planet it's going to go and settle itself into a rather boring part of the martian surface <laughs> the boringest part they could find on mars yeah well sometimes that's what you want um, so so they, they're going to go land somewhere exceedingly boring. They're going to watch this all transpire by from Mars Co. A and Mars Co. B, the two suitcase satellites that are accompanying Mars InSight. And uh, InSight is going to deploy a seismograph to measure landslides, uh, impacts, and, well, if there are earthquakes on Mars, we don't know for certain that there aren't. And and there is another face. What? There's a third face. I see the top of a head and it's gone. Sorry, Chad, you're going to have to delete that. Is it this? No, there was an extra person came into our channel for a moment. Oh, weird. Yeah. All right. Um, sorry, everyone. Sorry, I'm easily distracted yeah. and there was suddenly an extra human. All right. Um, Okay, Chad, I'm going to go back to answering that question. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, Mars InSight, it's going to, to deploy its size, seismograph, and it's going to look to map out landslide noise, rock impact noise, and there may be Mars quakes. We don't know for sure that, that are generated on the interior of the red planet. And with all these different kinds of things that are going to generate our primary waves and secondary waves, these compression waves and oscillatory waves, I, we're going to finally be able to figure out what is the interior structure of Mars. And one of the things we didn't talk about is how not just the Apollo 11, but all the subsequent Apollo seismographs putting all of their data together, data that spanned all the way up to 1977 we were able to figure out that the core of the moon has a partial melt layer, that it's inconsistent, asymmetric. All of the oddities of the lunar interior we got at initially just through seismography. We've, we've been able to help improve our understanding through the gravity mapping that we've done that we talked a little bit about a few episodes back, but it was really from measuring how waves move through the moon that we got a detailed understanding now we don't have this for mars right right and so this is the big question and i i love the taller like how careful this uh this this rover was built and the you know the, the seismology that it's going to be able to to do um, I don't know if you heard when they were constructing it and they had the chamber, they had a, they created a vacuum chamber where it was going to be, you know, running its n needle or however the, it works. And there was a slight leak in the, in the vacuum chamber and, and the air or the atmosphere going 
into it on Mars would be enough to make it not accurate. So they had to sort of tear the chamber apart and rebuild it because in their tests they learned that it that it was not um, it wasn't going to be sealed properly, and it and their and their data would have been mostly not the level of of uh, precision that they were going to need. Because, as you said, you know, Mars is old and probably dead, and there could be some activity. But how much activity, and are there Mars quakes happening? But not only that, it's going to detect meteorites smacking into the ground within a few kilometers of the spacecraft. Um, it's going to you know, it's going to provide that final, close, interior look at Mars that we've ne that we've never had, and uh, and so they really made the most precise machine for this one job. It drills a hole that is meters deep and drives this uh, the probe down into the regolith on Mars. Like this has never been tried before. And and they're going to be measuring the temperature. And this is the thing I'm most looking forward to because people have been talking about what they think the the temperature structure beneath the surface is, but we don't know for sure. Now, this is going to be another one of those scary landings. It's not quite the sky crane that we had with Mars Curiosity. That was frankly terrifying. This is much more of a SpaceX style landing with the retro rockets and everything. Uh, but yeah, we're 16 days ish away. Yeah. And, and we want everyone to understand what the seismology is good for before we get there. Because people, like you said, have been talking about how red and dead Mars and well red galaxies are uh and with Mars there is still that chance that there might still be active volcanism and if we can detect any kind of a liquid interior that unfortunately starts to say well that seasonal methane we're seeing maybe it's interiorly produced and it's just stuff melting now if we can completely eliminate any geological activity that's super cool yeah uh, and and then just in general um curiosity for curiosity's sake what is the inside of mars we want to know we want to know uh yeah there's a lot of great questions that, th that this is going to answer um now what are some other places that you think could really benefit from a, a similar seismology mission going to explore them series series for series. sure yeah, so Ceres we know has had active cryovolcanism. There have been a large number of uh, extinct and looking like they're active cryovolcanoes spotted all across its surface and mapped out in some detail. And we can, by using modeling of the slump rate, how quickly the volcanoes go from pointy volcano to hilly volcano, by using various models, they've been able to somewhat date how old they think the different dead volcanoes are. Um, it would be amazing to add seismographic information to try and see if we can map out the liquid pockets the same way we do with the magma pockets on Hawaii and in Iceland. Uh, so I would love, love, love to get seismometers all over Ceres. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I mean, Ceres is one of these icy worlds, um, more of a rocky icy world. I would love to see some of the outer stuff, right? Enceladus, Europa, and I know the New Horizons team would love to have had a seismometer that they could use to to understand what was going on with Pluto. How is it getting these glaciers of of nitrogen and and ammonia and methane and and the how did the rocky the the mountains of water ice form? There's one last place that I want to talk about seism seismology briefly, and that's the uh, the concept of astro seismology, which people will hear that term. Yes. What's going on there? So, so astro seismology is talking about the way waves propagate through stars. Stars, for a whole different variety of reasons, will end up 
with oscillations in their atmosphere. Pulsating variable stars, which is like my happy place, will build up massive oscillations uh, where they uh, essentially expand and contract like a beating heart. And they can do this either in mass with one massive oscillation of the entire surface. They can do this with harmonics where different parts of the surface are expanding while others are contracting. And by studying these large scale oscillations, we can actually measure over the fullness of time, by which I actually mean over a couple generations of human observations, we can start to see changes in a star's density, changes in, in what way through the Hertzman-Russell diagram that star is evolving. Now, beyond the massive pulsating variable stars, we, we find all kinds of smaller, more complicated harmonics in the atmospheres of stars, even like our sun, where you have all across the surface pockets that are rising and falling in a grid-like formation with these complex, highly interfering waves. And there was a project in the 90s, Gong, that got set up to constantly watch from monitors all across the surface of the planet these fine scaled oscillations that up until then had been predicted but hadn't really been observed. Gong was able to recover all the things that were predicted. And today we study the solar surface and the solar oscillations in higher resolution than it sometimes seems like we should be able to deal with, with terabytes of data per day coming down from the solar dynamic orbiter, allowing us to study waves moving through the solar atmosphere. Yeah, and it's and it's the same. I mean, you get star quakes, yeah. and they create waves that move through. And because they're you don't have the rock, you've just you've got the whole thing as a plasma. And but in the interior, the levels of density are so high that you do have layers. You have the radiative zone, and you have the core, and the density can be much more dense than than rock than than anything any metal that we have but it's hydrogen mashed together and so it's it's the exact same process where you get these waves moving through the various layers of the sun and it and then you see the the ripples on the sun and that tells you more about what's inside of it it's a it's a stunning when, science when one of the coolest things uh for me in variable star astronomy is that some of the dramatic period changes that we see are thought to potentially be linked to convective overshoot. And the way that I've always envisioned this is imagine if your lava lamp has that blob that's rising and it just keeps going and overshoots into your room and sends ripples through your atmosphere. That is a oversimplification of what might be happening in stars but it's still that same idea that sometimes what's going on just decides to uh, go on with a little bit more enthusiasm than it normally does that's awesome uh just to let everyone know next week we are going to be at a uh, convention but together Yes, and, so and there's going to be rockets involved. <laughs> yes, so um, we're going to uh, try to record somehow live. I'm not really sure what the plan is, so anticipate a strange time, but we will try to make it happen because we're going to be in the same place, and that's yep. always a lot of fun. So, all right. Uh, thanks, Pamela. Thank you, Fraser. And now we save. And then we saved. Okay. Uh, Susie, if you're watching, uh, we decided next week the topic is going to be uh, it's not aliens. It's never aliens unless it's aliens. Until it's aliens. There you go. And this is episode 505? This was 505, yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, tectonic activity of magnetars. That would have been a good. We should have talked about that. Of <sighs> neutron stars. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think we know that much about it. But you see star quakes on the surfaces of of neutron stars and No, we see magnetic events that are linked, linked to star quakes. Theoretically. Yeah. yeah. 
But it's amazing when you think about the 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 it's like the crust. That's what they think is is the crust of a neutron star is cracking and settling yeah. and earthquaking, and yet this stuff. You know, we know that the density is a teaspoon is as much as a mountain or whatever it is, right? Yeah. And like that's just crazy. So anyway, it's awesome. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, uh, so now we have wrapped up the main portion of the episode and now we're going to stick around and for another 15 minutes and answer your questions about space and or astronomy. Uh, Israel Palanyuki asks, why hasn't NASA standardized landing on Mars? It seems like we humans have sent enough craft to know what works and what doesn't. Because what works varies with how heavy your object is. And, and so the problem is that uh, like we initially landed fairly lightweight, tiny things, no big deal. And so like with Pathfinder in, I think it was the early nineties, mid nineties, uh, it was basically in a beach ball. It bounced around and that worked and we're like, cool, we'll scale that up. We'll use that for opportunity and spirit and spirit and opportunity bounced around like beach balls. Life was good. But curiosity weighed too much to do that. The beach balls basically would have burst yeah. and you would have ended up with splatted yeah. rover. Yeah, and you would have just had a parts, robot yeah. parts all over the surface of Mars. So so what we did with with that was we needed a way to land it where we couldn't put the retro rockets onto the rover itself. Uh, so we needed it to have basically a crane that would lower it to the surface. And we built what's called a sky crane, which was a hovering platform. This is me looking for things that I can use as, as demonstrations. So you can imagine that I'm trying to drop my, my friendly figurine onto the surface. My friendly figurine has some sort of a umbrella over his head. And in this case, the umbrella over his head has retro rockets that are angled off to the side so they aren't blasting him. But the retro rockets can break his fall and then that friendly umbrella stays hovering in place like a helicopter, but with rockets instead of propellers. Lowers our, our figurine down to the surface, and then it flies away and lands somewhere else. Now, that works for a rover, but it's super terrifying and complicated. With InSight, they're able to stick the retro rocket straight onto the lander. So InSight's just going to land. No sky crane required. Mm -hmm. So we've mastered three different technologies yeah. as a function of what the needs are. And and the problem is that, that the atmosphere of Mars is exactly as awful as it can possibly be for the purposes yeah. of landings. So so the problem is is that if you had a, like on the moon, landing on the moon is relatively straightforward because there is no atmosphere. So you you fly to the moon, you go in orbit around the moon, you lower your orbit, you slow your orbital velocity to a yeah. ballistic trajectory, you bring yourself down very carefully and you land on the surface of the moon. And if you're going coming in too fast, you kick on the retros a little bit and you go back up a little bit and you you play the lunar lander game. You know how this works. Um, but, and on Earth, right, you come in at an incredibly high velocity, you go into orbit, you slow yourself enough to enter the Earth's atmosphere, and then the Earth's atmosphere does all the heavy lifting and slows you down to, to free fall speed, and then you open up your parachute and you finish off the rest of the journey. Venus is yeah. like that, but even better. Venus is so easy to land on apart from the death. Um, Titan. The heat death. Titan, Titan has less death, more exciting. More Titan has twice the atmospheric density of Earth, uh, way less of the gravity, super easy to land on. You but can Mars fly around like Prometheus. Yeah, yeah, but 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 Mars has sort of like one percent the atmospheric density of Earth. So you can't do that that going into orbit and then lower your your orbit and go into this ballistic trajectory and land. And you can't do that, just go straight for the atmosphere and and try to go in and and let it slow you down. You splat onto the planet or skip off. So 
it's just it's the worst. And so the problem this and this is one of the big challenges and one of the things that Elon Musk and SpaceX is really working on is how can we land this gigantic spacecraft onto the surface of, of Mars? And the way they're going is they're going to do the whole thing propulsively. They're not even going to try to use the atmosphere. They're going to use it a little bit as they come in to aerodynamically break themselves. And then it's going to be a propulsive landing like what they do um, here on Earth with the landing of the of the first stage on the Falcon rocket. So it is a huge challenge. And and this is, I think, back to that original question is that people are just uh, they're trying every possible approach to figure out what is the way that's going to be the most dependable to, to land on 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 mars because it's hard and it eats spacecraft for breakfast as somebody yeah. said in a, in a bbc show once All right it's the world covered in dead robots <laughs> ricky buxton asks is there only one point of data on the insight mission or are they setting up a couple of seismometers <coughs> it's Just it's one. it's a single point of contact we're landing one spacecraft with a seismometer and and that's it which means it's not as ideal as we might wish, but by measuring the delay between P waves and S waves, it still allows you to map things out. It just doesn't allow you to, to do it well three-dimensionally. It just allows you to know kind of two-dimensionally how things look. Uh, check, Chez K says, uh, is the universe like a balloon and will it pop when it expands to capacity? It might shred. But it's not going to pop. So pop implies that uh, at a certain point, it it basically uh, exceeds the pulling together capacity of the universe, and it then goes into free form, exploding outwards uh, because of the internal pressure. Now, uh, it turns out that the internal pressure of our universe. Uh, is constant as a function of volume. This is the dark energy. And this is the weirdest thing in astronomy right now. For reasons that I think most of us just don't kind of want to talk about, dark energy is about one proton's worth of energy per cubic meter of the entire universe. And when we add new cubic meters to the universe, more dark energy comes with it. And, and this makes no sense. We can't explain this. But since the dark energy, the pressure, the whatever the expletive it is, is a constant with volume, the bigger we get, it doesn't mean that we're exerting a greater force outwards. And the, the analogy that I always like to give people is imagine the universe as a grid, like a grid of cubes. And early on in the universe, the the lines in the cubes the size of the cubes was very small but maybe it went on forever in all directions just imagine this grid that goes on forever in all directions and it was more dense and now here we are 13.8 year billion years later and the the grid has expanded in all directions the universe is less dense whatever whatever objects were in this grid each square of this grid is just bigger but it could still be going on forever in all directions. It's not like there's some kind of bubble and the bubble is growing. It is just a grid that was more dense in the past and it's less dense today and it could go on forever. And so exactly. And so there's not like some place that it's expanding into, which is like one of the earliest episodes that we did. Um, uh, Gab tier 11 asks, do neutron stars emit light since there's no fusion occurring? It's they're hot. So if you think about it, your your friendly neighborhood light bulb uh, does not have fusion going on inside of it, but it emits light. And Good this problem. is if it's incandescent light, it's because it's warm and the color of the light that we see off of an incandescent light is directly related to the temperature of the light. This is why we refer to red as uh, a warm color. It's because the light bulb is warm. Um, blue is a hot color, it turns out, in reality. And and as you go from red towards blue, it's a function of the temperature going up, up, up. Our zone neutron asks, stars are just hot. Um, and before I 
answer the question. I want to give Arjun a special shout out for being literally the best question asker out there. It, every episode that we do, Arjun is in there with some great questions, and I really appreciate uh, when 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 no one is like asking us any questions or we're like desperate. Arjun is in there with questions, so uh, so yeah. a special thanks to to that to being so dedicated. We really appreciate it. Um, how would a sky city be deployed on Venus? Uh, carefully. <laughs> how would you do it, right? So you you, so, you know so, you want to send the the or even yeah. just the blimp. How would you send the blimp? But eventually well, the sky city to Venus. How would you pull that off? So so the the way to think about it is more like have have you seen the um camping setups they have for on top of rainforest canopies for researchers that are are studying the surface of a rainforest you you essentially have a large net that is deployed out across the canopy which is for all intents and purposes a gassy buoyant substance except you're dealing with leaves instead of particles and by declare by deploying a super large surface area and then putting small things human beings on top of this massive surface area the canopy is able to support the camping structure here what we'd want to do is very similarly deploy some sort of a large surface area think multiple zeppelins underneath think giant raft and build on top of it where you have as as maximal a surface area to weight ratio as you can justify in your construction practice but i wonder how you 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 go from orbital velocity so you're going whatever twenty five thousand yeah. kilometers per hour to floating but not smacking into the ground right <laughs> so, I, so that's I, the i think that's the tricky part is yeah is falling at the ground and missing yeah, it it's definitely a matter of you you want to figure out how to break slowly but surely or quickly, I don't know which, in order to match the cloud velocities. Yeah. It's it's figuring out how to match the cloud velocities that's that's the complicated part. And then everything after that is just giant expanding balloons. Before you match the ground velocity. Uh, or match oh. the ground's altitude, I think, is the bigger concern. <laughs> um, uh, oh, Chad, Chad, Chad's watching, and he just uh, he just shared a link, and I'm gonna I'm gonna allow his link through because I trust Chad. <laughs> um, but oh, now Chad, yeah, Chad, you can't do. You just got timed out, Chad. You can't post. Let me make you a moderator. There. There you go, Chad. Now you can post all the links you want. Uh, Chad, of course, is our editor of the show. If Chad <laughs> wanted to vandalize the show and troll us, he could do it a thousand times in a thousand different ways. Yes. Chad, uh, stop posting links, says, <laughs> says Nightbot. Uh, you're, you're all right now, Chad. Um, so I wanted to give you, and I've got like a minute left. I wanted to say I finally finished reading the We Are Legion, We Are Bob series. Isn't I read the awesome? I read the last two books. Loved it. I just loved it. Uh, my so if you haven't read this, this is like what if a human being died was was turned into a computer and became a a von Neumann probe to explore the universe but and replicate it. and replicate and so he keeps making clones of himself and each one of these clones has a different personality a little bit but they all get along and it's this really uh, great concept and i loved it in a very similar way that i love the martian which i'm sure yeah. which is sort of why you had originally suggested it was like you are it is it is like an engineer checking off a to-do list for three yeah. books and they're wonderful. Like you just yeah. love the to-do list that's getting checked off. And you can't wait to hear the next thing that gets checked off. Um, you know, the stakes were pretty low in the first book and a half. And then the stakes ramp up in the second half of the of the second book and, and get a lot higher in the third book. But it never really, I don't know, it never really follows the trajectory of a traditional book with the climax in the same way. It... Um, 
it's very much it feels fairly low stakes along the whole way and very entertaining and very well written and very very similar in style to the martian uh, i really enjoyed it so if you are looking for a book series that is wildly entertaining um you won't be able to put it down and yet you're not gonna feel super i don't know challenged you're not gonna feel like you're really toughing your way through it. you're just gonna be it's you know it's it's, it's a, bubble gum it's, and popcorn it's great yeah exactly yep. it's it's like summer reading for a winter book yeah yeah uh just loved it and uh and so i i am now officially here to put my seal of approval on on the book as well i highly Excellent. recommend it so if anyone is looking for something to read and you haven't added this to your list go now buy a copy uh read it listen to it wherever fine books are sold sounds great what's next what should i read next oh man um there's so much good out there so uh john scalzi just came out with the second book in his collapsed empire series oh i haven't been reading those and it is one that looks at capitalism on an interplanetary scale and the things that we have to worry about as we spread ourselves out to worlds that each have only limited ability to keep their civilization alive and we require trade between worlds and what happens if you begin to lose your ability to have that trade and you have these people scattered all over the place and john scalzi did did the um the Locked forever in war series right? Didn't he, he did, did the, old man's war old man's war yeah yeah which i loved yeah uh that sounds great i i can't get enough scalzi so i'm i'll crank into that one next uh all right when i'm not playing rimworld um <laughs> <laughs> that's such a good game if anyone wants a recommendation for my absolute favorite video game the one that it feels like it's the perfect video game for me anyway is is rimworld i'm at 550 hours now in steam like it's oh, a problem God. yeah but it is such a good game and everyone i recommend it to is just completely hooked and addicted to it and i've got my, my daughter's playing it one of my best friends is playing it uh yeah i know it's such a good game yeah i need games that like like i'm gonna take on portal over christmas because i've never yeah it's gone more it's than like 10 five hours portal yeah. yeah 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 i can afford portal yeah, no, and you could never, you could, you could never stop playing RimWorld. It is bottomless because right? it's a story generating game. So it's like you have a team of colonists, and they land on this planet, and they're trying to survive, and awful things are happening to them, and you have to manage their their moods and help them build structures, and people are attacking them, and they, you know, a beloved pet will die, and then one of them will have a mental breakdown and go on a sh fire, you know, lighting things on fire, and then someone else will try to stop them, and. And yeah, it's just these great yeah, stories. Yeah, that's the kind of game that I like too much. Yeah, no, you'd myself. love it. You'd love right. RimWorld. Yeah, it's really good. It's like, you know, if you like Civilization, if you like I just do. one more turn. Except for Sim 6. It's Satan's Civilization. Don't play Sim yeah, 6. Yeah. And there's the other person again. Oh, there's a third uh, person in here. Hello, sorry. Um, I didn't mean to interrupt you or anything. No I problem. Had, had a one o'clock. Um, yeah, I got to go do that now. Okay. It's all right. I mean, if you want me to call back, no, it's all yeah, right. Yeah, I'll. I will. Yeah, you should definitely call back. We'll talk in one minute. All right. All right. Sorry, sorry Adam. <laughs> um, gotta stop the. Sorry. So I better go do that. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thanks, Pamela. We'll see you all okay. uh, next week in person. Sounds great. Yep. Bye. Can't wait. <laughs> bye. -bye.